photogrammetry is a technique to generate 3D models from a set of photographs. In this video, we will create a 3D model of this jug. We will see different options of setups and equipment and go through the process step by step together. The photogrammetry process starts with preparing your object. Make sure your object is clean and in good repair. For cultural heritage objects, you might have to consult with a specialist about preparing and handling the object. You should definitely ensure that you do not put the object in environments or through handling processes that are not suited for conservation purposes. In my case, I am using a personal object, which is not fragile, and it means I can handle it without gloves and without the help of a specialist. Once the object is prepared, you can start gathering all equipment you will need for taking the photos. The very basic setup is a smartphone and a good lighting situation. The ideal lighting situation is diffuse neutral light. This means that the light does not produce any harsh shadows on the object and does not have a color tinge to it. Take a look at the surface beneath my hand and notice that there is no dark harsh shadow when I wave it over the surface. This is an ideal condition for taking the photos. The easiest way to achieve this lighting is to photograph on a very overcast day like this. The clouds should completely cover the sky and the sun should not be directly visible. Whether or not you can photograph outside should be clarified with a conservation specialist when handling cultural heritage objects. You might even photograph an object that is already outside and immovable, like a statue or monument. If photographing outside is not an option, you can set up a room with daylight lamps. The color temperature of daylight lamps is regulated and should be around 5500 to 5600 Kelvin. The lamps should be distributed evenly and at the same distance from the object. The goal is again to achieve diffuse light that does not cast harsh shadows. You can do this by bouncing the light off a white surface rather than shining it directly onto the object. You can also use diffusion material. If you don't have a reflector, like I'm showing here, you can use white fabrics. But make sure that the diffusion material does not have a color tinge to it, as this will affect the color of your object. An ideal location option, like the one I am showing here, is a space with glass walls and roof that allows you to use the natural daylight of an overcast day, while still offering the protection from the glass ceiling and walls. If you have access to something like an empty greenhouse, you can also shoot there. Consider linking up with your local botanical garden to see if they have an empty greenhouse you can use as your shooting location. Another plus of this shooting location is that it has almost entirely neutral colors. This is important because if you shoot in a location with bright colors like rich green grass for example, the color of the surroundings will reflect into your object and affect the color rendition. At the very least, you want to put a neutral color right under your object that contrasts well with your object's color. In this case, the white of the table offers good neutral contrast to the metal gray of the object. You can either use an SLR camera or a smartphone with a decent quality camera to take your photos. When using a camera with exchangeable lenses, you should opt for a 50 mm lens. This focal length is closest to the human eye in depicting scenes. You should also photograph in manual mode and use settings to ensure large focus area and low noise and blur. For this purpose, you should set the aperture to a high value like 8 or 11. The shutter speed should not be lower than 1 one hundredth of a second to reduce motion blur. The ISO that is tolerable depends a lot on the camera model. Some cameras can produce sharp images even with higher ISO while others produce a lot of noise even with slightly higher ISO. Generally, if you are not comfortable and familiar with shooting in manual mode, it might be a better option to use the smartphone instead. When using a smartphone, you want to use an app that allows you to lock your camera settings. I'm using an app called ProCam that allows me to manually choose the settings. In this app, you do not have to choose the settings yourself if you are not familiar with them. You can simply tap the screen to focus on your object and let the phone choose the settings. Then press the lock icon on the bottom right. This locks the settings so that they don't change while you take your photos. 
This is the most important thing when using your phone, as your built-in camera app usually adjusts the settings on its own for every new photo, which can lead to inconsistent results in focus and white balance. For both camera and smartphone, you can either shoot in the image format RAW or JPEG. I recommend shooting JPEG if you are not going to do a lot of post-processing of the images or are not familiar with image editing. JPEGs are compressed but still produce enough quality to ensure a decent model build. Now that we have prepared our object, shooting location and camera, we can set up our object in the location and start photographing. As you can see, I am moving in circles around the object, taking photos on the same height level all around. You can do this from different angles, go higher for the next round and lower for the next round. The important thing is to stay at a relatively consistent distance from your object and keep the object in focus at all times. You do not want blurry photos as this will affect the texture of your final 3D object. You can also do some close-up shots of important areas of your object. One alternative to this setup is to use an electric turntable to turn the object and photograph it from a static tripod instead of moving around the object with the camera. Be careful with this method though, as it is only suitable for objects that have distinctive enough features. The jug I am using has a recognizable handle, pattern and spout. Compare it to this small vase, which does not have any distinctive features. The photogrammetry software uses the image information to calculate where a camera was positioned in relation to the object. If it cannot detect any changes in the object, it cannot calculate the geometry of the object. In this case, the changing background can give it the information that it needs to determine the camera position relative to the object. So only use the turntable option for objects with distinctive features. Another modification of the setup is to elevate the object slightly from the surface. I am demonstrating this here with a glass plane. This allows me to get more angles from the underside of the object. One big problem in photographing objects is to avoid reflections and glare on the object. This is because the software only sees what the image shows it, and as far as the computer is concerned, a glare on an object is simply a white spot, which it will bake into the texture of the object. Glares on your object will therefore result in flaws in the texture of your final 3D object. This is the reason why photogrammetry does not work on glass or highly reflective metal objects. For an object like we are using, you might still want to reduce the small glares on the metal. You can do this by using a so-called polarization filter that polarizes the light and minimizes glare. Once all your photos are done, Take them to your computer and save them in a dedicated and well-named folder so you can find them again later. If you used your phone to take your photos, never use a messaging service to transfer your photos from your phone to your computer. Messaging services usually compress images and you will lose quality. It's better to connect your phone to your computer with a cable or use a service like WeTransfer to transfer your images. If you have shot your photos in RAW format or want to do some small corrections like white balance and color adjustment, load your photos into photo editing software like Lightroom or the free alternative Darktable, make your adjustments and export your photos. Your photos are prepared and now we can take them into the photogrammetry software. There are a few options of softwares, some of them even free. In this demonstration we are using Agisoft Metashape. If you have not installed the program already, go to the Agisoft website and download the standard edition of Metashape. If you are not sure your computer can handle the program, compare your computer technical specs to the system requirements on the Agisoft website. Photogrammetry usually requires quite powerful technical specs. If you are considering purchasing a new computer and are unsure of which model is capable of performing photogrammetry, a general tip is to look for a computer that is marketed for gaming. If you cannot purchase a new computer and do not have access to a machine with suitable specs, you might consider using a cloud computing service to outsource your computer power. With Metashape installed, you can open the program and find the Workflow tab in the top menu. Start by loading your photos into the program with the Add Photos function. The Workflow tab will take you through the process step by step. After loading the photos, you go to the Workflow tab again and choose the Align Photos step. For the most part, you can leave the default options that the program suggests. If you want to know more about the settings, you can find tutorials on the Agisoft website. When aligning the photos, the program will evaluate the image information and position the photos according to the estimated camera positions. After this step, 
The viewer window will show a quite impressive rendition of all camera positions you took your object photos from. You will notice that there are some areas included in that rendition that are not your object. In order to reduce the computing effort, you can now use the resize region function to narrow the selection to the object you want to create a model of and exclude other parts of the image in the further process. Find the Workflow tab again and choose the Build Mesh step. Depending on your computer specs and the amount of photos you're using, this step might take a while. It can even take hours or up to several days for very detailed models. Keep this in mind when choosing a computer to perform the 3D modeling task and consider using a cloud computer or a dedicated workstation just for 3D modeling. Otherwise, you might not be able to use your computer for anything else for several hours while it generates a model. Once the mesh is built, you want to build the texture. Find the Workflow tab again and choose Build Texture. Your model is now finished and can be exported. Before you do this, you can clean up some areas of the model in Metashape by deleting extra parts of the object that are not supposed to be there. Finally, you can save your Metashape project and export your model. There are many different 3D model file formats. It is best to determine what your 3D object should be used for and find out what file format is required for the chosen purpose. For publishing on Sketchfab, for example, a good file format choice is .glb. If you plan to edit your model further in a program like Blender, a good file format choice is .obj. Now that your model is exported, you can stop there and use it for any application you want as it is. You can upload it to a platform like Sketchfab or use it for any in-museum applications you might have in mind. I recommend, however, that you invest some time into getting familiar with the free 3D modeling software Blender. Blender is a very powerful tool, completely free to use and very useful for cleaning up models, making short animations of your object and exporting in more file formats. There are many learning resources about Blender online and it pays off to learn at least the basic functions. I will show you how I use Blender for a few simple corrections. Open Blender and create a new project. Click on the default cube and press the letter X on the keyboard and delete the cube. Next, go to File, Import and choose the import for the format of your object, .obj in my case. Locate your object and import it. The basic steps I always perform in Blender are resetting the object origin point, removing any stray geometry, straightening the model and cutting off any excess mesh on the bottom of the object. Let's start with the origin point. Metashape usually sets the origin point to the middle of the original generated geometry. This also includes artifacts around the object, so the origin point is almost never in the center of the object itself. You can remedy this in Blender to ensure the object spins around itself and not an imaginary point somewhere off the object. Right-click your object and go to the Set Origin. Then select the Origin to Center of Mass Volume option. This usually puts the origin point to the right point. See how the object now spins around itself. Next, I remove any excess geometry that is still left in the model. This you can do by selecting the mesh points and hitting X on the keyboard to delete the vertices. Next, I select my object and press the R key on the keyboard. This activates the rotate function. I rotate the object until it is upright and straight. You can use the matrix point in Blender as an orientation for this. Left click once you are happy with the position. Finally, I cut off the bottom of the model as this is almost always a bit messy when it comes out of Metashape. Go to add on the top left corner. Select the mesh menu option and within that select the plane. A new plane will appear in the viewer. Click the new plane and press the G key on your keyboard to grab the plane and move it to a position where it cuts off the bottom of the object. When it is in the right position, left click to lock the position of the plane. Then click on your object. With your object selected, in the bottom right menu, choose the Modifier Properties tab. Add a modifier called Boolean. Make sure the Difference option is selected. Then, in the Object window, choose the Plane. Click on the little drop-down menu in the Modifier tab and select Apply. Once this is done, click on the Plane again. With the Plane selected, hit the X key and delete the Plane. 
Now your object's geometry should be neatly cut off in the bottom portion. After that, you can export your object from Blender and use it for any application. Photogrammetry is a fun but challenging process. The best way to learn it is to simply try it out yourself. There are many learning resources online. If you run into any problems, you can always find solutions on the internet. Once you get the hang of it, it is a fun process and a great asset in your skill set. Give it a try and start creating.